Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. My guest is Derek Jones. He is bassist with the Cirque du Soleil production Ka and uh, has a pretty rich history prior to that, as well as uh, a very interesting and circumlocutious career as a professional musician. Greetings, Derek. Good hey, to see you. Hey, how are you doing? Thanks, Daniel. Good to see you. So let's start with some basic background stuff. I know you grew up in the Bay Area, um, Vallejo, I believe, right? Vallejo, California. Yep. Um, I grew up there, started playing music. I think I found a guitar. I had a an old guitar in um, eighth grade, just on Christmas vacation, uh, started listening to music and uh, just different records my parents had. And luckily they had Tommy Garrett and his 50 guitars play the music of Italy and Tommy Garrett and his 50 guitars play the music of love. And it was, I still have the albums and they're, they're, right. they're um, fascinating because it's 50 guitars, like Howard Roberts, um, uh, my names are escaping me now, but there's like all the LA session guitar players were playing together in, in capital. Wow. And so you get that sound and it's just, da, 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 you know, and I was just like sitting there listening to it in my parents, you know, Magnavox Fluenco console system from 1968 that I still listen to music on downstairs. <laughs> mm. it's, just, it's amazing. So um, I grabbed this guitar and I grabbed a penny or a nickel for a pick and I just started learning the melodies. I just tuned up the strings and that's kind of how I caught the bug, I guess. I mean, you know, I had some earlier um, things where I wanted to play maybe clarinet and I didn't really get into that. And cello was a weird situation, didn't do well with that. Um, but uh, the guitar kind of stuck and then... Um, but you weren't, you weren't drawn to being a rock and roller. I think that's interesting. You know, a lot of, a lot well, of our I, generation was. You know. I was for a while. I mean, at, at the same time, MTV was just starting. Uh -huh. So I was, you know, I, I was really into soul and R&B music. Like I was into Cameo and Earth, Wind & Fire. And, but, you know, I grew up in a very cons religiously P Pentecostal family. So, uh, you know, it was very challenging to listen to other forms of music that weren't from my church. You the know, devil's so it was, music, yeah. Exactly. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, so I had to kind of like get on the radio and KFRC and all these different AM radio stations that played music. And I would just listen to stuff. I had this little, little radio and I would listen to things, but it didn't it play, playing along with that. Just playing along with music is really what changed me. It was like, Oh, I can be a part of this. I feel like I'm a part of this when I'm playing along with this record. I feel like I belong to something. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that was the beginning of me going, I want to belong to this clan. I want to, you know, I want, I want to belong to this group of people, this, you know, artist community, whatever it was. I didn't know. I just felt like I could be a part of this. So, um, but then I was also, when MTV came out, you know, my sister and I would sneak down, you know, sneak into the living room early. My parents were still asleep and we'd watch it Saturday mornings until they woke up and then we'd switch to cartoons. <laughs> and, you know, and it was like to run to turn the dial, you know. It's like, um, uh, so we got to see whatever was happening there. And then when I started playing guitar, I didn't understand the, 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 ma the magic of the rhythm guitar parts that I was hearing on all that R&B and soul stuff. I, then I heard Eddie Van Halen and I heard Judas Priest and I heard Iron Maiden. And I was like, oh, those guitars, especially Iron Maiden, man, those dual guitar parts. It was very orchestrated, really beautiful. I just thought, that's really cool. But then I looked at the record cover and I go, I'm never going to sell my parents on Let Me List Iron Maiden. <laughs> <laughs> that Eddie cover, man, on, you know, number of the, and then the album Number of the Beast. Oh, no, this is like the, their, their nightmare, you know? So I had to kind of sneak around. And then, um, so yeah, I, I, I did kind of get into it, but I didn't have an electric guitar. I still had an acoustic guitar. So I saved up a bunch of money and I went to the pawn shop downtown and I bought uh, a, a Seville uh, a copy of a Les Paul and a one watt amp. I remember the speaker said one watt and had a, it had a volume and a tone control. And I had that in my room for a while. And then I noticed if I turned it up louder, it would distort. So I was getting that distortion until I blew it up. I, the speaker just went, 
you know. Yeah, not and hard to blow up a wine bottle. <laughs> right. I just I didn't know what was. I was like, what happened? So then I had to kind of up. So then it was the the then that was the beginning of searching for tone, right? Because then you're like, all right, I got to get a better amp that I can play with my friends. Because this amp, I realized I couldn't play with anyone else. So then I had to find that out and and what sounds good. And you know, at that point, you know, you just go to the music store and get pamphlets and you know, stuff and read about stuff and, and dream about, you know, this new Fender amp that just came out or this, new, I ended up getting a Yamaha amp, a G112, which was a great amp. I could barely lift it, but I, you know, I had that, that was my first, like I could do gigs with this amp kind of amp. And, and um, so I was still, I was still into, you know, the metal stuff. And of course, Motley Crue, I wasn't as into, but I, yeah, it was just, it was just what I was hearing on the, on the radio. And then uh, I remember the last day of school in the ninth grade because uh, junior high where I was at was seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, and then high school was tenth, eleventh, twelfth. So we were everyone was allowed to bring their boom boxes to kind of you know play their music, which was a cacophony of sound. But I was walking along, and all of a sudden I heard this one thing, and it was Rush's Moving Pictures album, and it was Tom Sawyer. And I stopped in my tracks, and I went up to the guy and I said, "What is this?" And he told me, "Rush." And then everything changed again, because then it was like, I can hear every instrument. I can really hear the separation. And then it became, you know, awareness of a mix. <laughs> you know? Like, and, like when I look back. Really interesting. Yeah, that's a really interesting yeah. point, because you, you touched on that briefly a minute ago, and I wanted to redirect you to that sure. again. The, the understanding, not in this, I mean, it's one thing to be drawn to the music itself as a player, but I think it's another also to be when you awaken as a young person or, you know, as a beginning musician to the universal language of playing together, of yes. that communication, that interaction between parts, between musicians, that's a, that's a magical language. Well, I was talking to my son about this. He's, he'll be, almost, he'll be 10 in a couple of months. And I was telling him the reason I really want, I wanted to become a musician was the fact that I don't have to speak the language of the other musician to have a connection with them. I, we can sit down and come from di disparate parts, d backgrounds, but we can play a note together and smile. We can play a note together and start to, and if I can eat some of their food, maybe learn some dance steps, understand maybe some of their words, but music was the, the key to unlocking the door to being part of a global community, uh -huh. you know, because I didn't just like one kind of music. I mean, I, I did like one kind of music for a while and then rush odd uh, time signatures. Where do they come from? I mean, who lists? Oh, if you go to Bulgaria, those aren't odd time signatures. They're just time signatures. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they, they, yeah. they dance in five and 17, 16 and whatever. That, that's just part of their, Oh my God, you go to India. Oh, these are, microtonal stuff and things like that yeah yeah this is just natural to them to me it's like blowing my mind but to them it's like normal everyday stuff and then it just opened me up to that it excited me to say man i could find it's not just i can play with my friends if i get if i get really good and i can keep an open mind I can meet people from all over the world and play with them. And that was my whole goal at that point. I mean, I was like 17. I mean, I started, um, you know, I, I started gigging when I was 15. So I started playing guitar and then I got really into it. I heard Rush and then I was like, okay, that's Alex Lifeson's blowing my mind here. But everyone in the band is blowing my mind because I could hear everything and I could really hear hear what the importance of what the notes were and the placement of the notes i wasn't maybe getting it then i was just in you know i was like a sponge i couldn't really tell you why i was attracted to it but now i can look back and go it was because that was the first band where i could really every every part was everybody was playing something they were playing great and it just that that hit me and then I became this rush fanatic that had to get every album I could find. <laughs> and then, and then it, it drew me, I became the, the, the Canadian rock trio band because I heard triumph and then a saga. And I started hearing all these bands, they all ended up coming from Canada. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, Marillion, you know, like, I'm you know, moving to Toronto. Damn it. I'm going, man, this is <laughs> you know, I'm like, Whoa, what, what is all this? What's going on up there? This is like a whole other world. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, uh, but, uh, 
yeah, I just, I just wanted to connect and, um, and, and be a part of something. And it was kind of the irony is I was going to church three times a week and I wasn't connecting with anyone. You know, I was just like, I, I, you know, not understanding why and not, I was just like, what is happening? You know, so, but well, music. The, the, the roots of the, of the mu of music in the church you know, those are very, very different in a sense because it all comes from, you know, sacred monody and stuff like this, you know, right. which is in a way the almost the antithesis to what you're talking about, which is a growing of not only a musical vocabulary, which I think, you know, obviously is something that you've endeavored to do very, very strongly over the years. We'll get into that in a minute too. Sure. Um, but also I think the you know a lot of the music that comes from the church and i you know i use that term sort of generically is there's not a lot of interaction between the parts in the ancient music i mean yes you know as as that evolved into classical music you started getting choral choral parts and stuff like that but a lot of that is unison and what i think is really a big part of what drew me to music and i think I, I know from past conversations with you that uh is also true for you is that interaction that that give and take between the different musical parts when you when you really lock in with somebody when you're just it just jamming on something or whatever there's this there's this interaction yes which brings me to the one time i went to my friend's church was a which was a african-american baptist church Ooh, there's a different world. And I, uh, my mind was completely blown. Mm -hmm. I was like, what, why are we, you know, and then that gave me the ability to see, oh, people, These people are, are having fun. <laughs> people have, everybody has a different approach to whatever they do. Mm -hmm. Why can't we bring these all together? That, that got me thinking about why is church the, people go here people go here people go here we all separate do our little thing and then we come you know it, it, that was a whole that's a whole other conversation but i i don't think i mean everybody's church experience is, is different mine was what it was uh we had a pastor who was a classical pianist and his thing was just playing like liberace on every you know he was like you know and <laughs> so was, for, for the first half of my life i had liberace as a pastor you know and then wow and, and he was like you know playing you know he had his hair up done really high and he was you know i was that was his way to you know, kind of showcase himself, I guess. But, um, you know, um, it, it, I think, I think what I remember going to a youth group meeting on Wednesday night and this guy came to talk about sat Satan in, in secular music. And one of the, one of the first pictures was one of the rush album covers. And at that point I went, you lost me, man. I'm out. <laughs> I can't, I can't listen to you. Yeah. I get Eddie and I get like, number of the beast. Yeah. I could see how you would think, but no, nah, man, you can't take rush away from me. I'm not going to go anymore. <laughs> I just can't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to stop listening to rush. I'm sorry. But, um, but then, you know, as it evolved, uh, I, I got into jazz band in high school. Um, and then the drummer said, Hey, I've, I'm in this band that rehearses on Monday nights at the Moose Lodge, the generation Gap big band, and they need a guitar player. Would you want to do it? And I was like, gee, I, wow, that sounds intense. Uh, sure. You know? And, um, Luckily, I, I saw a, um, a documentary on him on PBS about Freddie Green uh -huh. and his guitar. And I remember watching that the Sunday before the Monday night rehearsal. And I went, okay, he played quarter notes. I can play quarter notes. That's what I'm going to do. You know, because <laughs> so I show up and, and um, uh, you know, it was a little tenuous because I was more of a rock and roll looking kid. Um, but um, I had some friends in the band and one of the piano player was mother of a couple of guys that I went to high school with. She was, you know. Uh, anyway, I, I played and they were like, great, you know, and I just knew to just play quarter notes and lock with the drummer and, you know, and that was my first, you know, we, we played, we, and, and everybody danced, right? So, you know, you're in the Moose Lodge, you're playing, we're playing tunes, like they had, some of these guys played with Tommy Dorsey and Stan Kenton and, you know, and so we had all these original charts, string of per, all these tunes. I didn't know, I'm just reading them, man. I'm just, I just, I'm playing in a band. <laughs> it was like so my first band wasn't a rock and roll band it was a it was a, a a big band playing tunes from the 30s and 40s which is actually 
I think musically that's not bad at all because a lot of those tunes Dude, it was, it was are based around melody and they're based around interesting chord harmony. Shape. I'm yeah. hearing the saxophone section, the trombone section, six yeah. trumpets and me, and I'm listening to what I'm playing and it really opened me up. And then I would just sit down and listen to the guys talk, you mm-hmm. know, and, and tell their stories. I learned how I learned that it's not good to practice on the gig because the whole trombone section stood up and yelled at me on a gig to shut up. And then I realized, okay, yeah, I, I got to remember these ideas for home. <laughs> so <laughs> the certain great things. I learned a lot of stuff on that gig and I made my first $25, $30 check. And my mom said, you're a professional. And I went, yep, I'm quitting school. She went, no, you're not. You know, but I, <laughs> at that point I was like, I can make a, I, if I, you know, if I have to live in my car, but I can play with the greatest musicians of the world, I'll just live in my car. I don't care. I just want to do this for the rest of my life. And at that point, I didn't really plan on, I didn't know how it was going to happen. Right. I just, I just loved playing. And then uh, just before my, just for my 12th grade last year of high school, I would go to the record store because I was just looking at that point. um, You know, my friend who had asked me to join the big band, I went over to his house. He played me Alan Hallsworth. And I was like, Oh, I don't even know, you know, the road games album. I was like, Oh, I don't even, should I even play guitar anymore? I don't even know. And then he played me Miles Davis's Britches Brew. And I was like, Oh, what? I don't even know what this is. And then I heard Pat Metheny and then Rush kind of took a back seat, sort of. And I heard Pat Metheny and I was done. And then I heard, uh, and then I started going to the library and they had a big record collection. So I would go and get some records and listen to those and Romantic Warrior album. All of a sudden, who's Al Miola? Whoa. And I was, learning all these Aldi Miola, trying to learn all this guitar stuff. And, and, you know, but one of those collections of records was Jocko's first album. And I didn't know who uh-huh. he was. I looked at the record cover and I went, I think he's a trombone player. So I read about him somewhere. I don't know. I just, I just grabbed anything. I didn't know who Charles Mingus was. I didn't know who Charlie Parker was. I would just grab records because I wanted to go, no. Yeah. I've heard these guys. You so were a sponge get, basically. I just, I just wanted to hear anything. Mm-hmm. You know, Diodato. I mean, yeah, whatever. I just grabbed albums and put them on and listened. And um, Jocko's record came on and when it was done, I was I was crying. I was like, I have to do, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have to do this. So, so was I, this the transition to bass then? Yes, this was an immediate boom. I wasn't a guitar player anymore. I had, a, I had an Alan Halsworth model Ibanez guitar on layaway at Best Music in Oakland, California. Next day I drove down there and put a bass on layaway. <laughs> I was you like, what that, are you doing? And I was like, I don't know. I have to be a bass player. That's so funny because I had a similar experience. I, I also came up playing rhythm guitar. I had dabbled in bass and I was playing rhythm guitar for several years in bands. And I actually had this beautiful custom wired ES-335 from the folks at Alembic. Oh, yeah. And, uh, well, My buddies. The, yeah. Yeah. Well, at that Rick point. Rick Turner uh, probably helped there, make that. Yeah, there was a... Um, at the very beginnings of Olympic, there was a, uh, they had a store as well called Stars Guitars. I remember Stars Guitars. And I walked in there with my 335 that Ron Armstrong, may he rest in peace. Oh, uh, I remember Ron. Well, Ron had I, worked on that guitar, wired it for stereo. And I came in there and I said, I've decided I'm going to be a bass player. And he looked at me and he gave me one of those looks that only your dad could give you, you know. <laughs> I have a Ron Armstrong story. Well, so, so, yeah. so I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, finish no, no. this very briefly. I, yeah. I, um, later. <laughs> I, um, I was looking at this vintage 57 precision bass hanging on the wall and I played it and I played a couple of others too, but I decided that was the one I wanted. And I said, you know, will you trade me straight across? And I, to this day, remember him agreeing to that and then putting the paperwork in front of me and saying to me, okay, sign here where it says complete fool. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, great. But I, I truly, you know, to your point, I truly understand the draw of bass as opposed to guitar. They're different worlds and there's a there's a completely different role that the bass player plays. I didn't understand any of that, really. I get I, I agree with you completely. I didn't understand. All of a sudden I just I just heard and it wasn't really Jocko's. It was, of course, Jocko's playing, but it was also his composition and his way of playing lines. Mm-hmm. Um but I just, I just thought, I just thought there's another level here, and I feel like bass is where I want to take it to. So I just got a bass, but I didn't really understand what bass was. I, I understand what Jocko did, and I understand what I, I kind of was getting into Getty Lee, you know. But I, I, that's all I, I knew. I didn't really, 
I didn't even think of going back to my R and B stuff and listening to those kind of things. I, that's, I, I a different, just, that's a different kind of bass. It yeah. was very much, you know, I, so I was kind of like a bass player playing walking lines and trying to learn how to solo, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I would have people tell me, well, you don't really play bass. And I was like, but I'm holding a bass, but I was a kid. I didn't know what it meant, sure. you know, until, you know, I mean, I, I, I didn't know. And years later, you know, so I, I, I started playing bass. I, I went to, I, then I went to college. I, I, I didn't know that you could study music in college. I was the first person to go to college in my immediate family. And I didn't know you could go to college for music. So I didn't even plan on going. And then like six months before I'm graduating high school, Someone says, oh, you can go, you, you know, I mean, our jazz band was, our jazz band, my jazz band teacher was kind of, he didn't really, he didn't really set me up, tell me any of this stuff, you know, so I didn't know. I'm just like, you know, so I went to Solano Community College and went there for a couple of years and played, played with the bands, played with the teacher there, his professional band, um, but still not really understanding the role of bass per se. I mean, I sort of did, but it was really about, I can't wait for my solo, right? I'm walking, I'm walking, but soon my solo sex is coming up. So I got to be ready for that. So I got to, you know, put myself on autopilot here to get ready for my solo ideas. And then when I went to Sonoma State University, I studied with a guy named Mel Graves. And I started, that's when I thought I'm going to start study upright bass because my, my father was like, you know, if you played upright and electric, it might just open up more work for you. And then I, you know, at that point, I, I, I had heard John Petitucci with the Chicory Electric Band, uh -huh. and he made it very clear that that's possible. And yeah. so did Brian Bromberg and a lot of guys, you know, I yes. mean, for me, it was Tony Levin, um, you know, there was a lot of many guys that were doing it well, and, 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 sh and it was, it was possible. So I thought, well, that I'll, I'll get into that. And, and immediately I had probably even more an affinity to the double bass than I did the electric when I first touched it, it was some kind of like thing. Um, well, it also, it, it defines the role of the bassist a little bit differently. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's an interesting thing because as you say, you came to it from a guitar and therefore you came to it with a certain sense of being part of the ensemble, but still wanting to be out there and, you know, be melodious and everything. And there is definitely, um, you know, there, there are plenty of bass players who people criticize for playing too much, for being too verbose. Um, people like Jocko are the exception or were the exception in the sense that they could hold down that bottom, they could groove. Then when that little 10 seconds come, when you can shine, they wail, but then they drop right back into that groove. And I think that's the, that's the, the role of the basis that, uh, that I know you've embraced because I've heard you play and I know that you are, you know, not only highly capable of it, but very, understanding of that you know there's um i like to say that a, a lot of times as a bassist you know people don't notice you until you stop playing yeah exactly and and i that was the role i still hadn't gotten that yet when i got to sonoma state i was i was more focused on technique and learning how to play this double bass mm -hmm. and um then i i remember going to the pacific coast jazz festival the second semester which i had um pacific coast jazz festival uc berkeley is like the big jazz collegiate jazz festival competition which i can't stand competitions in music let's not go there but um <laughs> I, I won i won the award for best bass player of the festival and i'd only be playing upright for like seven months and um but when the guy told me hey you Derek jones you won the award i went great so well, when you come to the award ceremony and i said i'm not going to be there what i've got a gig <laughs> I've got, i'm playing a, i'm play, i got it i won't be i'm here for the grade man you know i i, I gotta go you know, and he was like, what? I said, yeah, give it to somebody else. They'll get it to me. It's no big deal. You know, I, I just saw it as like, whatever, you know, and in fact, eventually I just stopped going to school because <laughs> my parents bought me a box of business cards. So why don't you see if you can do it for real? And that's when, when I got out of college for me, now I can't say this for everyone else. I can't say quitting school, you know, but for me, I knew it doesn't matter how good you are, you know? Uh, I think I think I, I played a graduation ceremony for Sonoma State and some of the students who graduated with their BA or their master's in music. And I asked them, what are they going to do? And one of them said, oh, I'm going to be a cartoonist in, in New Orleans. Another one said, I don't know. And another one said, I, I guess I'll go back and get my teaching degree. And these are all badass musicians. And I was thinking, well, what did you just spend eight years of your life playing in this school? And now you're not even going to do it now. You know, it's like, so that really hit me. And I was like, man, I got to get out and start meeting people 
in the world. Like, like, you know, so I started going to jam sessions and then I started getting calls, you know, and still not getting what changed everything for me as a bass player was when my friend Ben Hevero, we were teaching at the same music school and he said, man, are you, are you into Latin music at all? And the only thing I knew about Latin music was Carlos Santana, which was, I was a big fan of. I'd come home and play to the Moonflower record every day after school because mm -hmm. I love that album, which but, ironically. But that's not really typical. That, that's No, that's, that's what I mean. It, yeah, yeah. It, it's, der it's the derivative. It's, it comes from there, but it's not that. So I said, yes. man, I only really know that stuff. And um, he said, well, why don't you come to the house, man, and I'll show you. Because he was playing in this band, Los Quimbos Noventa. Ah. And that was like the band. And it was like, oh, this is Vilato's band, Father and Mala Timbali playing from Cuba, like genius. Played with Kachao, played with everyone. And, and so I went, sure, man. So I'd go every Tuesday and him and a conga player, uh, forgot his name, David or Danny. We would play, we would play through, and they showed me what Tumbao was, the bass line parts and what clave was and how three, two and two, three clave and how it shaped the phrasings of the horn section and the dancers um, and we would just play tunes, you know, and, and I started, and, and, and I realized, wow, if I don't do this line, the conga part doesn't work. And the piano Montuno, Montuno, the piano doesn't work. Oh, it's a part. Oh, I have a, this is a rhythmic role. I'm like a drummer that plays notes. And then it started yes. dawning on me like, oh, playing bass, you know, before it was just, I like play jazz tunes and walk and you know, all this stuff. And, and I'd play in rock bands, a little bit in blues gigs, you know, and I do and do, but I wasn't really thinking about the role of it. You know, the, the, the reason why the, the placement of the note, the length of the note, the and, loudness, and being softness the bridge, of the note. really being the bridge between the rhythm and, and the exactly. Melody. This, is, yeah. this is what really got me. And then, uh -huh. and then he said, you want to audition for Los Kimbos? They're having a big audition. And I went, yeah, man, I just want to be at Orestes. I, and this is the thing maybe, where I was telling, when I taught at UNLV for a couple of semesters, I would tell my students, show up, just go somewhere. Don't think about it. You're never ready. You are never, you know, no one's ever ready to do anything. Yep. <laughs> you, yep. You just show up. And I would show up to jam sessions, not ready. I, maybe I'd have one tune. I'd get lucky. What do you want to play? Uh, uh, Autumn leaves. You know, it's like, but I knew that tune or can I play the head on blah, 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 you know, and, and, and I'd, I'd have some things ready, but, but most of the time I was way over my head. And at this audition, I was way over my head. And I've said this story many times. Orestes comes in, he sees me, my friend Ben introduces me to him. And, and he says, uh, you know, uh, well, some people know salsa and then some people know salsa. And I said, well, sir, I'm about right here. <laughs> but I'm just, I can't believe I'm standing in front of you. I just, I'm just so honored to be in your presence. And he went, okay. And then Ben says, okay. Um, if he gives you the evil eye, you're done. And Red S doesn't play around. I said, man, he's going to give me the evil eye in three seconds. If I can get his phone number and get a lesson from him and ask him some questions, that's all I'm here for. That's it. But they had given me three tunes to work on. So I worked, I did my homework. I'm not an idiot. You know, I, I always get shocked by people that actually have the charts and then don't work on them. Uh -huh. or have somebody gives them two weeks to prepare for something and they wait like to the day before. And then they wonder, I didn't get the gig. And I was looking at them like, yeah, cause you sucked. Cause you weren't prepared. You're I mean, a success come on. maybe. Yeah. 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 You know, it's like, it's like, come on, you know, sure. maybe, but, but for me, I just worked on all the stuff and then we went through it. We started playing the first tune. What else is looking at me like, Whoa. And then I'm thinking, Oh, what a nice guy. He's going to let me play the whole song. <laughs> like, what a cool guy. I thought he was going to rip me a new one as soon as we started playing. Uh -huh. So the second song, he starts looking at me and he's dancing. And I'm like, what a cool guy. He's going to let me play another song. Get to the third tune. I'm playing. And then he takes a solo in the middle of it. And the whole universe dumps on me. And I'm hearing stuff. And I'm just trying to hold on and play this groove. And as I'm doing this, I'm going... If I fall off of this, this is how important every bass line you ever play for the rest of your life is because yes. everybody's counting on this. And you're if holding you fall, it down. Yeah. You know, I ended up getting the gig. You know, it was like, you know, I'm, I'm truncating everything, but I ended up getting the gig, which terrified me because I was like, I am nowhere way ready. <laughs> I should, but he, 
He saw something in me. And for the first six months, man, he'd play me all this great music and I'd go and try and do some cool stuff. And he'd go, no. And I had to just play simple. And here's what the difference between um, the audiences I was playing for in blues and clubs and jazz gigs is that when people would come up to me and go, wow, you sounded great. Well, I knew I sucked on some stuff, but they didn't hear it. Okay. I'm playing at Alta Vista Salsa Club in San Francisco. And I'm playing and I messed up. When I, we took our break, two guys came up to me and said, hey, man, if you mess up our dance steps with our ladies again next set, we're going to hurt you. Ooh. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God. Everybody knew I messed up. Not just the band. The band I get. But, you know, and, and every, you know, the, the first six months, man, there was bass players on the side of the stage watching me like this going, why, and going up to Odessa, why'd you hire this kid? I should be in this band. What are you doing? You know, so I knew it was, it was a dick. But when two guys that I didn't even know came up to me and said, hey, man, we, we know our music. You don't. <laughs> I, I, I was amazed, but I was like, wow, this is much deeper than, th th this responsibility is much deeper than any other music I ever played. So I, I was in salsa bands for, I mean, I went from Los Kimbos to Pete Escovito, who ended up being the percussion, the tambali player on the Moonflower record. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Then I, I, and that's Sheila E's dad. So through sure. that, I met Sheila and I was just going from, you know, I had guys like the wonderful Paul Van Bakkenegen who passed away a few years ago. Um, amazing drummer played with Andy Norell played with Ray Obiedo. I mean, that's how I started playing with Ray. That's how I started playing with Pete. Cause Paul said, Hey, this, you know, Pete's brother, Mark, amazing bass player plays with tower power. Now Yes. Mm -hmm. um, didn't, wasn't going to be able to play in Pete's band. Well, I played with Ray Obiedo and pops came and played. And then he said, Derek, can you come down to rehearsal? You know, I don't know. I mean, but I got really, but because I knew now I really um, started understanding music of South America, music of, I started playing with Marco Silva and the, and learning the Brazilian music, which is way different. Yes. You know, every, every culture in the South, in that area has a different way of approaching it. Merengue is the difference from Haitian music is way different. I had a friend who was studied Haitian drumming, Kendrick Freeman, and he would show me Haitian drumming and show me the, the different role because Haitian drums, the Haitian grooves roll in a different way than, than Cuba or Puerto Rico or, or any of these places, I mean, you know, and, and cumbia is different, you know, the length. Of, so I just started length of note, short, long, long, short. What? Oh, loud, soft. How do I, you know, that became the most important thing. And then it was like, oh, okay. So then because I, 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 I studied that, then when I played a jazz gig, What's my role? How do I make this walking bass line? Then I listened to Ray Brown and Ron Carter and Dave Holland and all these Mark Johnson and everybody so differently because then I was like, I wasn't listening to their solos per se. I was listening to how they played with the drummer. Right. You're listening to the groove. And, I, and I I'm listening to all that. Yeah. To your point, what, what you're saying here that I think is so important is that you worked on gaining a musical vocabulary. Yeah, that was broad. And that I think, you know, it's funny, you know, you mentioned like, you know, you, you mentioned previously Rush. Now, years ago, I um, had a conversation with um, with a heavy metal musician. Talk to me about Rush. You know, mm -hmm. I've talked to country musicians who've talked to me about Rush, you know, yeah. and Rush is definitely an acquired taste, you know, at the same time. Um, I think that it's so interesting when you talk to really dedicated musicians, we are none of us one dimensional, you know, you, no. you know, it's like a musician who may be known for heavy metal. You, you know, you talk to them and then you find out they adore classical music. Mm -hmm. You know, there are so many different tie-ins there. And I think the importance of having a really broad musical vocabulary, even if you never play classical, if you understand classical, you're going to be a better guitarist. If you understand the the evolution of different types of music, different genres of music, it enables you not only to talk to, as you say, different camps of musicians. It enabled it enabled you as a young white kid to fit into a you know to fit into Latin music, for example. But more than that, you bring all those influences to all the other music you do, and I think that enriches every every genre of music that you play. I think the important thing you said there was listening. 
Yes. Yes. Um, Paying attention. We don't have to watch the music. We, we and 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 I didn't. I did have a book called Funkifying the Clave: Afro-Cuban Grooves for Bass and Drums by the amazing Lincoln Goins and Robbie Amin, just amazing musicians who played with Dave Valentine and did, and Mike Stern, all these people. And that was my Bible, kind of, you know, to learn how to play this stuff. But the accompanying CD that came with the book was it. And I think for anyone, you know, it doesn't really matter, even if you don't understand what you're listening to, you've got to take the time to listen to this stuff. You can't just read it in a book. You can't just, you know, look, a, look at a video, which happens a lot. And, and I think, you know, the hardest part is to play it with others. You know, you have to find, I mean, I was very, very, very fortunate to be in the Bay Area when I was, to be able to play with people from all over the world. Yeah. You know, in that area, there was, you know, I would do a klezmer gig. I would do a salsa gig. I would play with Paul Hansen, the bassoon stuff and all his original music. I was playing with Kai Eckhart at a two bass and drums trio because Kai had moved to Berkeley, to Berkeley and I got a lesson with him. And all of a sudden I was in a band with him. And, you know, these, these people and all of these people, David Garibaldi was record because I met him through Paul Hansen's band and he was recommending me. That's why I met Ray Obiedo. You know, it's like all these people took the time to, to, to talk to me, to play with me, to help me understand things in a different way. Because you took the time to listen to them. Right. Because, because it was all about <laughs> listening, you know, and I, I think that, that really, it's really what it comes down to is, is sitting down and listening to a piece of music will, will help you way more than having the chart and practicing the line because you just don't know how to play the line. But if you listen to how the lines, lines played, then you understand the phrasing, the shortness and longness of the notes, the, the loud and soft, the dynamics, all the stuff, you know. So, mm -hmm. but, you know, and, and you just kind of, you know, I didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't have any mad, you know, like I'm going to be a salsa musician. I just, I just loved playing in that setting, you know, and I loved, I loved the feel of that music and I loved what it was teaching me about. And in, and each music, you know, playing with Zakir Hussain, you know, um, I got to go to Finland with him, with my friend, George Brooks, wonderful saxophone player who has spent his life taking jazz and Indian music and putting it together on the horn. And, um, so it was George's gig at this jazz festival. And I remember, you know, Zakir just talking about, you know, like letting the instrument tell him what it was, would be allowed to do in this climate mm -hmm. because every, he plays all over the world all the time. And he's like, okay. And we started doing sound check and he started tuning the drums and he would say, uh, probably not going to be able to do this today. Oh, but I can do this. You know? And I was like, and I asked him, what is that? He said, well, you know, I mean, the drums a organic thing and it's being affected by wherever it is and the environment that's in i am bowing to the to the now basically you know i'm allowing the now to tell me what is needed and what i can what? do and it was like whoa i just was like uh -huh. wow i don't have to force my instrument to do anything i just got to allow the instrument to let me do it and to fit into yeah everything else not force anything just allow yourself to be in the now and fit in i was like i took that in meta i went to metaphor heaven you know just kind of uh, went, whoa uh -huh. there's way he said something he said a lot of stuff here you know and and hanging out with the shish khan who plays sarod which is this amazing instrument with three melody yes. strings and 32 sympathetic string and yes. he's asking me i'm playing fretless bass on the gig so i'm asking him how does he approach and he's playing melodies on one string, which made me go, oh, I should be practicing up and down instead of across. Oh, this is much more vocal. You know, just, 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 you know, I've always mm -hmm. been just like, I, I'm not afraid to ask questions and I'm not afraid to share my knowledge because as Mick Goodrick said, knowledge is not a, a, a hamburger. And right. you, go, what? Right. you know, if I cut a hamburger in half, you, you, we each get a half a hamburger. If I share all my knowledge with you, we, I still retain my knowledge. Yep. I was like, man, yep. that's a beautiful, another beautiful metaphor. It's a beautiful analogy. Yeah. yeah. Now, so, so let's, let's, um, let's jump a little bit ahead yeah. because you, you segued then um, rather abruptly into moving to Nashville and all of a sudden playing with Jerry Douglas, playing with Nickel Creek, um, completely yeah. different world musically. How'd it that just, happen? Well, it was just kind of a thing where I was, I was, I was 30 years old and I was looking around the Bay Area and I was like, well, who, who are the bass players 10, 15 years older than me and what are they doing? 
And I thought we're all kind of doing the same stuff. I mean, something, some of the guys are doing cooler stuff, but, but we're all kind of, you know, the guys that are, that are the, the top calls, which is, fortunately I became one of those guys. So I thought I'd go to LA. I went down and did the magic pilots, magic show pilot episode week with Sheila E. She had me come down and play. Um, that ended up not happening for me, which is fine. And I didn't know really what was going on, but I was working with a, a double player, wonderful, fantastic musician, one of my favorite people in the world, Rob Ikes. And Rob, uh, I did three albums with him. I met him through a, a mutual friend, Joe Craven, who was the percussionist and violinist with David Grisman Quartet and a dear friend. And, and then he, he, he was from the Bay Area and he'd lived in Nashville about 10 years. So he started telling me about it and I was like, oh, maybe I'll come out. And then I met Victor Wooten and Bela at a festival and Vic and I kept in touch and Vic, I asked him about it. He goes, man, you should come out, check it out. I think you'd, you'd dig it. And then I talked to my, uh, my friend, Rick Turner and Rick said, I wouldn't recommend anybody move to Nashville, but I would recommend you move to Nashville. <laughs> it was kind of like, okay. So I went out for a NAMM show and stayed with Rob and stayed for a week. And, um, I started running into other friends of mine that lived there that I had no idea lived there, you know, and, and my buddy, Paul Hansen was in town because he was there playing with the Flectones. So <clears throat> got to hang with Paul and just trying to check out the scene. And then I came home and I told my wife, I said, I said, Hey babe, you know, maybe we should think of moving there in the next couple of years. She goes, if we don't do it right now, we'll never do it. And we put our house up for sale two days later and it sold a day later. Wow. And it was like, happen, huh? <laughs> uh, I guess we're moving to Nashville. And it was, it was insane. It was crazy, but I didn't know anybody. I just knew Rob and Vic, <clears throat> but those guys don't really gig in town. That much. So I was kind of uh, all of a sudden, you know, had a reputation to nobody knows and nobody cares who you are, man. You know, so that was a, that was an interesting education, but I ended up uh, going to a jam session again with Jeff Coffin put on every, every week. And then all of a sudden he called me to his house and then I was in his band. So we would play at cafe one, two, three, this club that was downtown or not downtown. It's kind of uptown, but um, uh, so we would play there. And then, um, you know, I was just meeting people through him and uh, started, started working a little bit, started doing a little bit of sessions, not much though, but you know, a few things here and there. And then uh, Chris Steely moved to town and he started sitting in with Jeff's band. And then, uh, and Chris was wonderful because Chris, uh, same kind of thing. He's like, a, he's like, his mind is open to anything, you know? Yeah. So he's, you know, I'll, I'll play with anyone, you know? Yeah. And so he was playing with us and it was great. You know, and mandolin with was playing all these lines. And it was like, man, this guy's wonderful, you know? And then he asked me, Hey, would you be interested in checking out my band? And I said, well, who's your band? Nickel Creek. I said, what do you guys do? I wasn't really, you know, I had played with the Daryl Anger, Mike Marshall band. So I was aware of Chris mm -hmm. through Mike and, uh, you know, and, but I didn't really know what Nickel Creek was about. I'd, I'd heard different things. Um, and then uh, they came over to my apartment and we played some tunes and it was beautiful. And I said, sure, let's do this. So that's, and that's kind of, you know, it, it was kind of like I bypassed or, or went around the five to seven year town thing I was told before you get any work. <laughs> and a year later, I'm playing with this band that's just about ready to hit on country music television right so and then yeah so um again i i didn't really know much about bluegrass music other than playing with rob ikes but his was a, a derivative i mean his was kind of like he, he was mixing it with different things yeah i mean and same I thing with grisman you know grisman was bluegrass yeah. but jazz but yeah 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 he was creating his thing so i you know but i ended up not playing electric bass for like four years in nashville i was an upright guy and I just kind of, at first I was a little bit worried out by it, but then I just went, okay, well, I'm just doing that. And, and then through, through Nickel Creek, I met Jerry Douglas and we were opening for Allison Krause and Union Station and featuring Jerry Douglas. And um, we, uh, he talked to me backstage and said, I'm going I'm to be calling you one day. And I went, oh, cool, man. And then my tenure with Nickel Creek ended and I actually called him and I said, hey, man. And then like a, a month later, he gives me a call. And uh, uh, I went over to his house and hung out with him and he was great and uh, started playing in that band. And that was great. That, um, that was an awesome experience. And we, the last record I did in Nashville was um, Best Kept Secret. And I actually co-wrote a tune with him on that. And we did a wonderful version of A Remark You Made, the Zamital tune and, and uh, beautiful. But I, I had to learn, 
it was funny. I didn't really understand because none of these bands had banjo players. Mm -hmm. And the banjo really is the drummer because yes. they do all the roles and stuff, you know. And then I, I, I ended up meeting Kristen Benson, I think was her name. Amazing banjo player in Nashville. She's just an incredible musician. And she was playing in this bluegrass band that I got called. I, I can't remember the name of the singer, but it was a friend of Rob Ike's. And um, they said, would you come out and play a couple of shows with us? <clears throat> and I went, sure. And I played with Kristen and I went, oh, <laughs> there's this groove, just nonstop eighth notes, just slamming. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, I can lock with, this is what you lock with. Oh, okay. And that really, she really, Kristen Benson, you know, I haven't really talked to her since those two gigs, but I always find, man, if you can get anything from anywhere, grab it and, and hold on to it. So what I got from her was the understanding of my role with a banjo player. Well, again, though, it goes and back it, to the same concept of understanding the musical interaction and where exactly you lock in. What, where I place my notes, the which big is picture. way different. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, if you make your note too short, it sounds weird. If you make it too long, it's like, uh, you yeah. know, so I would listen yeah. to all these guys. Uh, Dennis Crouch is a genius of that. And, uh, you know, I'd go to see certain baseball. I'd go to the station in and see Dennis play. And I just and he's such a cool guy. And we'd hang out and I just listened to him. And then once he had me sit in with the band and that was really nice of him to let me do that, you know, to get a feel of Texas swing and, and how that fits. And mm -hmm. he was a Bob Moore disciple, you know, he was like really into Bob. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, yeah, yeah. So I just, you know, the N Nashville thing was just kind of a, I didn't know. I just knew, uh, well, there was many reasons that I kind of went there, but I just wanted to try something different and, I guess Julie and I wanted to try something different. There was a lot. We did a lot of growing at that time because it was just three of us now. We didn't have our families around us. It was like, wow, you know, so. But. I want to segue to something here because you, you've you mentioned this a few times and I think it's important to mention. Um, and that is not just being willing to do everything and try everything, but really being willing to interact, you know, because there's, as we know, if you're going to be a professional musician, playing the gig is obviously the, the tip of the iceberg on top. But there's all that other stuff. There's all the, the idea of just being a good hang, you know, being able to interact with people, being able to get along with people. Because you're on a tour bus with somebody, you're spending, you know, other than the, the time you spend on stage, there's 22 more hours in a day. You know, I call it and, bus chops. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Bus chops. That's a good term. Yeah. It's, it's um, and I think that's another aspect that people don't understand. Um, you know, I watch a lot of, a lot of great, you know, especially nowadays, you see a lot of, not just bass players, but really great musicians who will turn on a YouTube channel and, you know, or create a YouTube channel and they'll sit there and they'll play something and you just sit there and, you know, I'm watching 12-year-old drummers and, you know, 10-year-old bass players who just absolutely have chops that will blow me away, you know. At the same time, I think to myself, okay, but do you understand the dynamics of getting along with other people, of working with other people, not just working musically, although that's part of it too, because a lot of these younger people are just playing in a vacuum in that sense, but, but understanding the dynamics of networking and, you know, Making they will. friends. You they know? will. They will. Uh -huh. I have I have a friend, a dear friend, and his daughter is one of those players. Uh -huh. She's on YouTube. She just was on uh, a, a national talk show playing, just killing it. And That's she's cool. nine years old. Uh-huh. And a certain very famous bass player, a couple of them, who I will not name, started criticizing her and her family for taking advantage of her gift, and she will never have a job and she will never understand this. And I have a problem with that because these kids are 10, 12 years old. They just love to play music. Mm -hmm. They don't have the opportunity to play with the band yet, but their parents are musicians or whatever and, and, and encourage them. And they put them on YouTube. Whatever you feel about that is fine. But to say now at that age, now, yeah, there's some kids that are older and they haven't played with a band, but they will. And they'll realize, oops, yeah, and, 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 I'm, and I'm not criticizing yeah. that at all. Yeah. I'm just saying, you know, I yeah. think that that's, that's they don't have an opportunity. Yeah. yeah, they don't have an opportunity. They're just trying to they're just trying to reach out 
and they're using YouTube as a way to reach out. Mm -hmm. And some of those kids, like the, dr the, the drummer for Stanley Clark now, Stanley found him on YouTube. And, you know, you just, you know, but he had been playing in bands and, and stuff. And he was like, you know, right out of high school and, 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 and that. But I think the, the, the underlying thing for me is vulnerability in all this. Um, allowing yes. yourself to be vulnerable, man, you know, allowing yourself to, mm -hmm. to, 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 to be open and vulnerable to other people's ideas. You know, you can't, you can't, um, you can't create and, and hide your heart. And, and yes. you can't, you, you've got to wear your heart on your sleeve, you know, well, to be able to really those moments, those moments that you're having those interactions, they're very, very special moments. And they are, as you say, they're very vulnerable moments where you open up to the groove. Yeah. It's life. You know, it is. I don't, we are, we don't have lives. We are life. You know, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have a breath. I just breathe. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, so when those moments happen, we're all breathing and, and reacting to each other. It's just the nature of life, you know, and, and um, connection through that breath and being vulnerable and not being, you know, I think uh, maybe that's what I've learned most of all this process in my life is the times when I allow myself to be vulnerable and just, you know, and admit, yeah, I shouldn't be here or admit, I, admitting I don't know and being okay with letting people know I don't know. Can you help to sit me? without knowing to sit without yes. knowing and just allow, you know, ask the question, how do I do this? Yes. You know, yes. Uh, every situation that I've been in, you know, has, I've never really known w much about it. I just kind of showed up and I would, tried to be nice. Um, I tried to be, you know, aware if someone gave me direction, I was like, okay. It wasn't like, what? You know, I was like, I'm here. How can I help you? How can I make your, how can I make your music be better? Mm -hmm. I, I, show me what you want. Show me what you need. And music, a lot of times I tell people music will tell us what it wants. Let's not worry about it. <laughs> Let's just start playing and see what it wants. You know, that's how I, you know, so I, I think, you know, and being on a tour bus, all that stuff you learn. You know, you, you, vulnerability is a, is an amazing power and tool that we can use to, to, to transcend ourselves and to share ourselves with others. And I kind of think for me, that's what's why I, again, playing music, you know, I'm, I'm not defending anything. I'm just playing. I, I mean, I, I can't, I can't change anybody's mind if they like me or don't like me. Some people love my playing. Some people, ah, you know, and my ego would go, Oh, we got to get those people that go, ah, we got to show them that we're happening. I was like, I don't have enough time. <laughs> it's like, I, I just, I just think, you know, again, it's just showing up and, 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 you know, yeah, I mean, I show up and I'm, I still get nervous on gigs. But why not? You know, you still, I mean, it's like the day you're not, then you, then you're not impassioned anymore. I think, I think, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think that, but that, that vulnerability thing is, is, uh, that's a key. really good point, Derek. Yeah. It really is because I, I think it's not just the vulnerability itself, but it's opening yourself up to being part of a larger creative process. Yeah. You know, and that, uh, you know, it, it's, um, I mean, yeah, you call it bus chops and it is, you know, to a certain extent, it's about getting along with other people and being a good hand. Yeah, the social aspect of yeah, music, right? The social aspect too. But again, that comes down to, as you say, being vulnerable, being humble, and at the same time, being confident. And, uh, and, and actually, um, I, I know we're, we're, we're running, we're running out of time, but I want to, I want to segue that into something that you, into a story that you told me, which I think will illustrate a lot of that. You told me about um, your process of auditioning for your current gig. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so when I was living in Nashville, um, they had a thing called the Nashville Sing scene. It's just kind of like the Las Vegas Weekly or the pink section in the Chronicle in San Francisco. It just kind of shows you what's going on around town, shows and movies. and Back when stuff. they used to print newspapers, you mean? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and, and, and so I was looking through the Nashville scene and I looked on the bottom of one of the pages and it said, Cirque du Soleil is auditioning artists of any kind. If you're interested, email us here. So I went, huh? Yeah. I mean, 
the backstory on that is when when Julie and I moved to Nashville, um, we we were kind of struggling a bit because our house that we thought was going to sell all of a sudden maybe not selling. We didn't have any money. <laughs> Christmas is like our daughter opening presents and us sitting in chairs looking at each other going, what have we done? <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're just like, oh my God. But Bravo was on. We had free cable through the, uh, through the um, uh, apartment complex. So we watched Bravo and it was Cirque du Soleil Day and we watched all the Cirque shows that day and I was like, wow, this is really cool. Mm -hmm. Huh, it'd be fun to check a show out one day. That's beautiful, you know? Alegria was really the show that made me go, wow, I'd, I'd love to maybe do that someday. Um, so then when I saw the auditions, I thought back to that. Well, I'll email them. And they said, well, can you get us a, a photo and some examples of your playing? So um, my friend of mine, she was a photographer. She took a picture of me, a headshot. And he, I took some CDs over that I played on. He put a CD together, different examples of my playing. I sent a little bio to them. And that was it. Audition August 4th. This was 2004. And uh, so I went over to SR Studios in Nashville and brought all my bases and uh, they had cameras, three people from Cirque and then a, a Nashville sound guy. And I sneer, laugh a little bit because you'll understand why in a second. Um, so um, I get my upright out. I'm starting to play and they, they, they say, well, wait, 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 don't start yet. We, we're ready. We got to turn on the video cameras. What, what piece are you playing? And I said, I'm not playing. I'm just warming up, you know, just kind of yeah. like everything. Oh, oh, great. You know, so then it was like, Okay, here's a, and at that moment, um, it's not like it is now. Now it's really, man, you could just go to their website, upload your videos to the YouTube channel and you, and you could be on their radar pretty quickly, mm -hmm. you know, which I'm still amazed at how many people don't do it. <laughs> they ask me, well, you know, how do you do this? I tell them. And then like a year and a half later, have you done it? Oh no, I haven't done it yet. Three shows have been created already and you weren't even on the radar. So, um, so it's like, okay, we're going to play a piece of music for you. And uh, you come up with a bass line. Let's do it uh -huh. once and then we'll play it again. Okay, come up with the bass line. Okay, now we're going to play the music with the bass line. You're going to play that back to us. Okay, boom, play it back. And it was that way, just kind of coming up with different ideas. And I go, hey, I got another idea. Grab another bass, come up with a different idea. And they were just like, whoa. And so I just kept giving them ideas for an hour. We were just having fun. <clears throat> and then it was, well, I was packing up my basses. And then uh, Anne Marie Duchesne um, comes up to me, she's a wonderful person. And she goes, very kindly says, okay, um, that was the music part of the audition. Uh, you're, not next part of the, you're not done yet. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And she goes, uh, we're going to have you sing and dance and act. And we know you're not a singer, a dancer, or an actor, but we just want to see um, how you move and, and everything. And I knew right then, this is why every other musician tanks the audition, because they say, no, I don't do that. And again, vulnerability, right? What they allowed me to do in the first hour was bring all my knowledge and show them what I could do and bring them into my world. Now they wanted me to trust them to be in their world mm. with video cameras running, by the way. Uh -huh. <laughs> no pressure. Mm -hmm. So uh, it turns out I was the only musician in two weeks that said yes to this in Nashville. Wow. Me and one other guy, my friend, Dan Emmel, who I called after my audition, went, go down there, tell him I sent you an audition. And him and I were the only two people hired for anything. Wow. That, that from that thing. And I told him, be aware, be aware. They're going to ask you to do all this stuff. Just do it, man. Just don't worry about it. So I went, sure, I'll do it. And she went, really? I went, yeah. Okay. And then they, you know, we're going to put on some music and you just move your body to it. And then when you're done, stop moving. So they put on this drum music and it was like North African type thing. And I, I thought, well, what did Salif Keita's dancers do when we went to see his show? And I jumped up in the air and just started going crazy. And they all went, whoa, what's going on? And then I, I, I was out of breath and I landed on one leg. And I stopped moving. And I tried to keep my balance. And I was thinking, just shut off the music. Just shut off the music. The Nashville sound guy just started busting up laughing. He was just like, <laughs> it was just like, he was like, he'd never seen it. I was laughing. And then they just all went, whoa, they loved it. They were like, you know, the three, uh, that's great. I'm, you know, and then they, they uh, say, walk across stage twice, stop at this microphone and say who you are, what you do and why you want to work for Cirque. And I'm totally out of breath. So I'm like, my name is Derek Jones. <laughs> And I, you know, and all this stuff. So it's, it's really funny. And, and if then I don't they had pass you, out, I want to yeah. work for Cirque, right? <laughs> and then they go, sing. And I said, what? Anything. So I was listening to Yvonne Leans on the way in. So I just tapped some. Da, 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 da. I don't know. I just sang something, right? Just tap that and sang, you know? And uh, okay. And then they had me, you know, do another thing. I don't remember that. And the last thing they said was, um, okay, we're going to put the camera right in your face. 
and you're going to describe the words we say with just your facial expressions. So I went, okay. And then ready, go. And then broccoli, lemon, trash, you know, and I'm just moving my face and they're, they're kind of laughing and I don't know what I'm doing, but I can kind of see my face in a reflection of the lens. So I was just kind of using that to not repeat my moves too much. I was like, okay, they don't know I can see me, but I, I can kind of see me. So but I was that's, just doing that's acting. Yeah, exactly. I'm kind of looking at myself, you know, kind of moving my face in different ways. And then they said, okay, show us Derek Jones. And then I just look at the camera and they show us the opposite of Derek Jones. And I turned around and walked away because <laughs> I was totally out of ideas at that point. And they all laughed. And then, and then it was like, well, man, you know, would you sign? Would you be interested to work with us? I said, yes. And um, it could be two weeks or two years from now before you, we call you because there's no shows available. We're just here meeting new artists. And I went, great. And that was it. And I was done. And I figured maybe in a year or two, I'd hear from them. I just kind of forgot about it, you know. And then on Thanksgiving Day, they emailed me, emergency. And they said, you're available for a show tomorrow. And I was like, that's not real. But I, I wrote them back. I'm not doing anything tomorrow. Give me a call. And they called right away. And then it was like, no, we are totally serious. And uh, so a week later, I got the gig. Wow. And, and I was like, I'm moving to Las Vegas. Whoa. But it was great because I wanted to be closer to family. And mm -hmm. I kind of called Jerry and he was like, yeah, man, I'm so glad to hear that because Allison Krauss is so booked next year. I don't have any time to use my band on anything. And I was really worried about you guys, but I'm glad you're covered. And I was like, wow, okay, that's a good timing. Timing you know? is everything. Yeah. But, you know, again, it was just like being, uh, being available, you know, like, like that whole thought of like, oh, okay, they want me to trust them to go into their world. If I don't trust them, how can they trust me to play one of their shows? How, how could they want to hire me if I just gave them all these cool things and I didn't reciprocate and allow them to guide me in, in, in the disciplines that I know nothing about? Right. And I think that's and really a them. good point. Yeah, It's a trust, trust thing. It was totally yeah. a trust thing, man. It was like, if I say no right now, that's it. I'll never work with Cirque again. If I say yes, oh, what's the worst that can happen? I can embarrass myself and have the, the sound guy from Nashville laugh at me, which I thought was great. But it turned out to be very, very good, you know, because all of a sudden I'm, I'm on this show doing 460 something shows a year. Uh, and I don't have to travel anymore. I don't have to get on a plane. I don't have to get on a bus. I can come home every night. What's that going to be like? And I thought it would last for two years. I didn't know, you know, 17 years later, here I am about ready to go back to work after the pandemic on Saturday. And I'm like so excited and it's amazing. But that, again, that's the, the thing, you know, I mean, I would, I would tell students when I was at, again, when I was teaching UNLV about 10 years ago, these four walls aren't real. It's a great place to gain knowledge, but it's not a great place to use it. You know, and you need to get out and use it. You need to meet people that are doing it. You need to take them to lunch. I used to take people to lunch, man. I used to like meet guys and I just want to ask you some questions and I would pay for the lunch, even though I didn't have a lot of money, but I thought, and everyone, I'd get one thing from that lunch that I could go, okay, I could use that. And again, and, being vulnerable, yeah, being vulnerable and just going, yes. I, you know, what do you think of my plan? You know, I took a lesson with the great Peter Erskine and I told him, I just want you to totally take me apart. <laughs> You know? And he goes, really? I went, yeah. He said, okay, let's get into it. And we recorded some music together and then we'd listen back to the, the thing and he'd ask me, what were you thinking there? And then I actually wrote a, a paper on it and he gave me an A, which was great. But I went to his house and paid him a lot of money just because I was like, I got to meet him through some friends. And I said, do you teach? And he was like, well, yeah, but you know, I, I kind of get a lesson. And I went to his house. He was like, why are you here? I said, I want you to deconstruct everything. Just And I learned so much from him just sharing his life and and sharing his his concepts and what he thought about my playing and 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 he was very he was he was extremely kind and very cool but also i told him don't hold back and he didn't and um i i came back from that 10 I'm, it's been 10 years and i'm still i still am so thankful for that i thought it was last time i saw him you know but but I, I always think it's so invaluable to talk with people like that, you know, and, yes. and, and be cool with them not liking something about you. Well, and you know, also and, just be, be on a peer level with them, even if they are somebody that you idolize and admire. The idea of being open to being on a peer level with them, again, goes back to what you're talking about, about vulnerability.
yeah, we started tracking the first, it was like me and Bob Shepard on saxophone and an engineer and I paid for it all. And then we just played like five different ideas and then we'd listen back and talk about it. And Bob would share some ideas and I totally respect Bob Shepard. He's one of the greats. So what I was getting was gold, man, because you know, yeah. I was like, okay, don't do this. Oh, don't think that way when you do this. Oh yeah. To actually wait, listen to somebody else before you come up with an idea. Listen to what they're doing and try and fit in with that. Don't like impose your idea. You know, maybe, maybe play less. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, you know, it was, it was like, just, yeah, there's nothing wrong with not playing. I mean, Miles Davis said, what do you say? If you don't have anything to play, don't play. Yeah. Wait till you have an idea. Oh, and it's really hard for string and piano and percussionists because we don't have to really breathe when we play. Right. Like a horn player right. has to stop finally. So I yes. used to think, wow, man, okay. Or a singer, yeah. Singer, they can't just, uh, <laughs> it's like they have but, to but take a breath. But you learn so much from their phrasing and, and that's a really that's good That's my point. point. You, you have to stop to playing. Breathe. Yeah. You need, like Joe Lovano said, I play the spaces between the notes. And I was like, yeah. yeah, man, that's where I listen for the space between the notes. I'm like, oh, yeah. So it's, it's things like that. You know, just you, you file them in your, your, your filing system and you, you, you keep them going. And, and uh, you know, and again, you just, you just show up. You know, a lot of times it's just like you show up and you're cool and you're nice. You know, it doesn't take a lot, just a smile and, hey, how you doing? You, you don't have to talk a lot. You, you don't show have to, up and you be present. You show up and you be present and, and you know what you're doing. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. <laughs> shed 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 at home learn everything you can about your instrument so that i mean being a great musician gets your foot in the door slightly that's it it's not going to be like i'm going to be a great musician and i'll just get gigs no it's about chemistry working with human beings understanding socially how things work and uh you know being present which you know is is uh is the most important thing you know and, and get your get your chops together in whatever you do so that when the opportunity opens up you're ready for that but you're never ready for the other stuff you know you're, you you just don't know what's gonna be what where and how you know you just but at least you're confident enough in what you're doing to be able to to get the job done and then learn from it in the process true stuff man there you go I look forward to seeing you playing live again soon yeah man i I'm, I'm i'm excited i mean i've been doing a doing few gigs here in town and sessions and stuff but it'd be nice it's going to be nice to get back and see everyone and see the family again and and man play the shows again and and, and see how it's evolved because we're all different now right year yeah. 19 months wow 19 months man so it, it's going to be a a fascinating you know evolution to experience you know to see, <clears throat> excuse me to yes. see how we've grown and what we've gone through everyone's gone through some really hard times you know so sure. Sure. it's going to be uh life-changing good yeah, yeah. life-changing experiences and it's going to be really good to to reconnect again so yeah Derek jones thank you for being my guest daniel it's been a pleasure as always absolutely hey i'm daniel keller don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for insights and sound